Welcome to Top 500. On this channel, we'll be taking a look at the Forbes 500 list. At number 500, we have the Cintas Corporation. They began in 1929 as the Acme Industrial Laundry Company, founded by Richard Doc Farmer. He collected chemical-soaked rags from factories and washed and returned them to customers for a fee. In the early 1940s, rags were replaced by shop towels, which are uniform in size and shape and much more absorbent than old rags and tablecloths. By then, the company's name had changed to Acme Wiper and Industrial Laundry. I think it only makes sense. This is the very first video I've ever made on this channel. And at number 500 sits a literal rags to riches story. In every shape, way, and form, it is rags to riches. On this channel, I'm not going to so much focus on the riches. I'm going to focus more on the rags end of the story, where these men and women started, where these companies originated from. The Cintas saga is a literal rags to riches story. Doc Farmer started out as a rag man, who with his son Herschel, built up a thriving industrial linen business in the 1930s and 1940s. But it was his third generation leader, Richard T. Farmer, who would guide the company into uniform rental in the late 1950s and lead a trend-setting consolidation of that industry in the 1980s and 1990s. Before we get into that story, let's go way back to the beginning. The foundations of the family enterprise date to the 1930s when Doc Farmer started a rag business. Born in 1884, Farmer joined the John Robinson Traveling Circus as an animal trainer at the age of 14. There he met and married a trapeze artist named Amelia Boven. According to a 1962 article in the Post and Time Star from Cincinnati, a tragic accident ended both performers' careers in 1908. A more recent account of these early days notes that this phase in the family history ended when the circus closed due to the Great Depression. Whatever the case may be, forced from his profession, Farmer dabbled in amateur boxing. From the bits I've read, he was a bare-knuckle boxer on river barges on the Ohio River. He dabbled in blacksmithing and railroading before turning to junk collecting in 1929. He soon concentrated his efforts on salvaging household rags, which he would launder and sell to factories as cleanup cloths. It was not long before this business evolved into a rag rental service, with Farmer completing the recycling loop by picking up dirty rags at the plants, washing them, and returning them to the customer. Farmer moved his business and family from northern Kentucky across the Ohio River to Cincinnati in 1936. By this time, the Acme overall and rag laundry had grown enough to warrant conversion of a local bathhouse into a laundry. Joined by his adopted son, Herschel, Farmer and his family painstakingly refurbished the building at night and on weekends. Unfortunately, tragedy struck the farmers a second time when the business suffered heavy damage from a major flood in 1937. The family quickly rebuilt resuming business by the end of the following year. Herschel assumed leadership of the company upon his father's death in 1952 and carried on much as his father had. Rapid growth at the family company began in the late 1950s, following the arrival of Richard T. Dick Farmer, son of Herschel. Born in 1934, Young Richard graduated from Miami University of Ohio in 1956 and joined the U.S. Marines. His stint as an officer was cut short, however, and Richard was discharged for medical reasons in 1957. He returned home that year and joined the family business. Acme had just 15 employees at the time. Dick Farmer helped uniform rental sales increase from $300,000 in 1959 to $847,000 in 1963. Scarred by the financial struggles of the Great Depression, Herschel strongly resisted his son's notion that the company should borrow to finance growth. However, Richard's youthful enthusiasm soon won him over. In 1957, Herschel relinquished day-to-day -day management of the business to his 23-year-old son. 
He then put together a business plan to open small uniform rental plants all over the United States. The first opened in Cleveland in October 1968. In 1972, the company changed its name to Cintas and then went public in 1983. During this period, uniforms were rented to individual, mostly blue collar businesses ranging from large industrial plants to corner auto repair shops. In the 1960s, Richard hit on the first of several innovations that would help make his company an industry leader. Up to this time, most industrial uniforms were fashioned from all cotton fabric, which required a great deal of ironing and could only be expected to last a year. The development of easy care poly cotton blends in the mid 1960s presented a unique opportunity for the company. Made of 65% cotton and 35% polyester, the fabric resisted wrinkling but held a crease. Uniforms made from the new blend could last at least twice as long as cotton ones. Dick Farmer drew up exclusive contracts with the developers of this new material and made major investments in the conversion of his plant from soap and water laundering to the dry cleaning that was then the ideal care for the new blend. By 1966, Acme was laundering about 80 tons of uniforms a week and making annual revenues of $1.8 million. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, Cintas tapped the corporate identity segment of the uniform market. Dick Farmer broke into this market by convincing companies of the benefits uniformed employees bring to the workplace. Employees in uniform are perceived to be trained, competent, and dependable. They also help convey images of cleanliness, safety, and security. Acme, soon to be Cintas, designed uniforms especially for each segment, incorporating corporate logos and signature colors in highly functional clothing, tailored for each particular work environment. Working with national companies compelled Cintas to grow geographically in order to service its new customers. By 1972, it had established offices throughout Ohio and in Chicago, Detroit, and Washington, D.C. Sales surpassed the $10 million mark in 1973. Within two years, Cintas boasted operations in 13 states. The 1980s witnessed an unprecedented consolidation of the service industry, which shrunk from about 1,600 mom and pop companies in 81 to less than 800 by the early 1990s. Cintas was one of a handful of trend-setting companies, among them Aramark Uniform Services Incorporated, which I've shown many times in my dumpster diving videos where I've shown a full dumpster full of old blue jeans and uniform shirts and stuff. Just a tremendous, tremendous amount of stuff they put in that dumpster. For those of you that may have watched that video, those videos. By the early 90s, the company had a presence in three-fourths of the nation's 100 largest markets, and its market share had more than doubled from about 3.5% in 1983 to 10%. Although I want to point this part out, only about one-third of Cintas growth during this period was generated by these acquisitions, with the remainder coming strictly from organic growth. In the latter years of the decade, Cintas spearheaded the uniform industry's expansion from a blue-collar base into more tailored uniforms for hotel and motel employees, restaurant workers, and even bank employees. Within its airline constituency, for example, the company moved from coveralls for baggage handlers and mechanics to uniforms for pilots, flight attendants, and other customer service workers. By the mid-1990s, major national clients included Walmart, Delta, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Northwest Airlines, Chevron, Jiffy Lube, Sunoco, Amco, Safety Clean, and Chemlon. Through the middle part of the 1990s, Cintas added 70 new cities to its service area. As it grew, the company also focused on improving its productivity. It brought in automated manufacturing systems featuring computerized design, cutting, and embroidery machines. While electronic data interchange systems used barcoding to manage inventory, processing, and distribution, mechanization of laundering facilities cut staffing and those operations in half. In 1995, Cintas acquired Toronto's Cadet Uniform Services Limited. While Cintas grew geographically, the company also began to experiment with new product lines. In the late 1990s, they began to acquire first aid and safety companies. 
While at first it was just kind of an interesting sideline activity, CentOS quickly assembled four major brands through acquisition and over the next three years picked up over 100 small first aid companies. So at this point, CentOS is becoming a giant and now they have big pockets and they're pretty much just buying up all kinds of different companies and stuff. By 1999, they had grown to over 200 uniform rental facilities across the United States. It had expanded its manufacturing facilities from four to 13. It had six distribution centers. Its clean room business had grown to six facilities and its first aid business now had 32 business centers. About 4 million people put on a CentOS uniform every day. The uniform rental market in total was worth about $10 billion annually in the late 1990s. But CentOS management thought that figure could still grow to around $31 billion. The company's research showed that some 37 million people worked in occupations where uniforms could or should be used. They were successful expanding into the first aid area too, assembling an array of small companies and unifying them into one brand, which debuted in the year 2000 as Expect First Aid. The first aid division and other services outside of uniform rental still accounted for less than a quarter of CentOS revenue, however. As the industry leader, CentOS was nevertheless still intent on growing and consolidating. In 2002, the company spent $22 million to acquire certain portions of the uniform manufacturing and marketing division of the Missouri-based laundry company Angelica Corporation. One month after the Angelica sale was completed, CentOS announced it had bought out Omni Services Incorporated in what was its largest acquisition, surpassing a Unitog company deal of years earlier that I didn't mention. The merger was expected to bump CentOS sales to around $2.5 billion, and it would clearly continue to lead the industry over the next several years. So like I said earlier in the video, I kind of want to make these videos more about the people who started these giant companies rather than the last few minutes I've been talking about mergers and buying stuff and I mean that's that's all good strategy too but I have a feeling this new channel of mine is going to uncover some very colorful people these people that went from rags to riches and that's the most interesting part of this channel hopefully I haven't looked into the other companies yet I have a hunch we're going to uncover some very colorful individuals that started these big giant companies and hopefully for all the viewers watching, that'll be the real interesting stuff. So now let's go back about 100 years and look at a couple of trapeze artists that started gathering rags. Richard Doc Farmer, once a bare knuckle boxer, once an animal trainer in a circus, a trapeze artist, a blacksmith, a junk collector. When the circus faded, he began collecting dirty chemical soaked rags from factories washing them and returning them back to those customers for a fee. And today what he started is number 500 on the Forbes magazine top 500 list. I hope you enjoyed this little video traveling through time. And as always, thanks for watching.